All right, guys, so I wanted to take a moment to really appreciate the genetic diversity of figs and uh, really take a moment to also appreciate the fig collection or the different varieties that I have really acquired over the years. Um, I want to thank the people that uh, have either sold me these cuttings, sold me trees, or have given them to me, whether that was, uh, you know, for nothing or for, let's say, a trade. And the fig community has been really good to me over the years. I've tried my best to pay it back to you guys, to the different people who have been good to me, but also just in general to the fig community. Um, to give you guys as much information, as credible as information as I could. You know, I'm not always right, but I always try to be honest and try to give you guys my true and honest opinion um, and not lead you guys astray. You know, so a lot of people were kind of upset a little bit over the last few years with, uh, with me as an example just because I've been kind of, people think I've been getting kind of discouraged with figs and I haven't been collecting as many fig varieties as I'd say I used to, or maybe the passion that I used to have isn't necessarily there or it's not coming through in the videos and maybe, and people have been actually thinking that I've, you know, kind of been going away or not, haven't been into figs nearly as much as I have in the past. Um, which is slightly true, but it's not really the case. My, my passion is still there for these fruits. I'm still extremely excited when I open up a new variety, when I go through the different trees I have and experience these fruits. It's just amazing to keep learning continually throughout this process. Um, it's never a dull moment. You know, there's always, it's never, you never know everything. You know, there's always something new to learn and Every single year, I keep continuing to uh, expand my knowledge and test what I know as well. Being open-minded, uh, particularly on topics, at least lately, on uh, pinching and really trying to determine if pinching does indeed give you, you know, fruits that ripen about two weeks earlier. So we've done a couple years actually of no pinching now. We've done maybe like four or five years now of pinching. So we've really have been kind of comparing the data just to figure out and be open-minded and learn. Um, try to give you guys the best information I could uh, so that you guys can make good decisions, not just, you know, for my own sake, you know, doing this for my own benefit, but no matter where you guys live, in different climates, um, different soils, whatever. And um, so that's, you know, kind of... Some of the thoughts that have been on my mind is that I've, I've just acquired such an incredible diversity of figs and, and the really special ones that people, I think, uh, get really carried away over, you know, some of the big names or something that's rare or whatever it is, and they don't really pay attention to what's reality of, are you going to actually ripen these fruits um, and eat them at a high quality consistently? I mean, that's what this is all about. I've talked a lot about this this past year, but... You know, Black Madeira is a great fig. It's, to my opinion, it's a 4.8 out of 5 on my flavor scale, um, on my taste rating scale. And that's fantastic, but, you know, I only get about 5% of the crop that actually ripens well here, uh, that doesn't split, and that gets to the point where it is a 4.8 out of 5. Because if it doesn't ripen well, and it splits or it spoils before it gets totally ripe, then it's not a 4.8. Maybe it's only a 4. Maybe it's only a 3. And a lot of them are actually inedible. So you have to go with varieties that are good for your climates. And I try to do that for you guys in these humid places. We just get so much rain here. Um, and I hope that people are you know, also listening to me when I talk a lot about the flavor of these fruits. Because you know, maybe it performs well here. But if, it's gonna, if you're going to be in a dry place, it's pretty much going to perform well there. I mean, you can pretty much guarantee it. 
there's been very few cases, if any, that I think are legitimate where you had a fig in a humid climate and it did well there and didn't do well in a dry climate. So when you're listening to me, you should be thinking about, oh, well, which one of these are the tastiest and grow those. Or maybe there's a particular characteristic that you're looking for. And yeah, I know some of the figs spoil in, in really warm conditions. Um, and not all the figs that don't spoil here won't spoil in a, dry, in a really hot, humid, or a really hot and dry place like Southern California, but um, you won't know until you try, and at least you're gonna go with something that's, I think, really tasty. So I'm just overwhelmed. I'm super happy with what I have here in front of me, and I, that's what I've been saying for the last year and why people think I'm so discouraged by, by figs is that I found I found the varieties, guys. I found them. You know, I've tested them, some of them now for a number of years. Some of these are new. But I mean, look at, just look at these. And it's also just a testament. I don't want to toot my own horn because that's not what this video is about. But like, these, this is a really a testament to how I grow figs. It's not enough to have the right genetics. This is Black Celeste. It's amazing, you know, it's incredible. It's gonna have this amazing pigmentation almost every time. You know, Jawale Noir is up there with some of the Col de Doms and really has a super thick, awesome pulp. And that's awesome genetically, you know, that's part of that. But being in a humid place like this, it's not enough just to grow the genetics and expect these fruits to, to ripen like this. You gotta be paying attention to that water and I've been saying this for years. How many people in, the, in a, you know, a climate like my own, in these humid places, do you see ripening fruits like this? You know, I don't know of many. And again, I don't want to toot my own horn, but it's all in the water. That's really all it is. I'm not like some magic grower, you know, that has a better soil or a better fertilizer. It's just the fact that I am very diligent on controlling how much water these fruits get and dialing that in using these drip emitters, you know? Making sure that my soil is well draining so that it doesn't hold too much water and then the, the trees don't uptake too much of that water. And then of course, it the genetics come into play. You don't, you're not gonna get really tasty figs in a climate like mine, or really any climate without the right genetics. So, and I've been talking to you guys about what, am, what are the varieties, what are the characteristics of these figs that I'm looking for to get myself a, a good tasting fig. And you guys can use those same principles um, and apply that to your own climate. You know, here we've talked a lot about on the blog, especially figboss.com, we've talked a lot about the characteristics that produce a really high quality fruit. It's not just the water, right? It's not just the genetics. We talk about hang time, having a shorter hang time. How long does this fruit have to ripen on the tree before it's perfectly ripe and you pick it? You know, from this green and hard stage here to then perfectly ripe. How many days is that in your particular climate? If it takes, you know, upwards of 10 days, well, think about that, right? How often does it rain in your climate? How often do you have some weird climatic event you know, that comes in every 10 days. For me, we get rain here at like at least once a week. So if I have a fig that has a really short hang time of four or five days, then I'm able to mostly avoid the rain. Now, I also care about the rain resistance. How is the skin on it? Is the skin able to withstand a lot of that moisture, even if it does rain? How is it going to shed that water? Is the shape correct? Does it have an elongated shape? You know, like this Juale Noir that has a long shape to it, or like this Pissoludo that has a longer stem and a longer neck to then let it hang in the right way to then, of course, shed that water and prevent that splitting. Prevent that splitting, we don't have the interior exposed and we don't have to resist those elements from outside trying to destroy the inside of the fig nearly as much. We've got it 
already built in because the skin, that's what the skin's job is. That's what the outside shell of the fruit is for. So I'm giving you guys the tools. I've been doing this now for years, trying to help you guys and teach you guys. And it just, I think this is just a nice ode to that. Real quickly, this is a fruit here called Verdone. Very good, I've had it for a couple years now. I've been slowly, slowly more and more impressed. This is Pissoludo, a new one this year that I've been planting all over the yard because I know it's gonna be so good and it turns out it's a lot like Smith in terms of flavor. Here's um, Black Celeste, we've talked a lot about this. I mean, just look at it, right? Easily the darkest fig I, I grow. The one there in the middle is um, Green Michurinska. Super, super good fig. And then here's Jewali Noir. Why do I have to look for new figs? I've already got some insane genetics, you know? Um, of course I'm gonna keep looking. Of course I'm going to continue to dedicate my life to this hobby and to spreading around these, these very interesting varieties. Pretty soon we're gonna be looking at a lot of unknowns, you know, in Philadelphia and trying to, um, you know, save some of these trees, but also really find some interesting varieties that already exist in the Northeast of the United States. There's so many of them. Just driving around Philadelphia, you see fig trees all over the place. And some of them, yeah, it might be Celeste. Some of them might be Brown Turkey or Hardy Chicago or, you know, White Marseille, even Osborne Prolific, but, um, or even Dalmaty or LDA. I mean, the, a lot of the common varieties are all over the place, but there's a chance I could find something real special. And that's what I took a chance with these varieties here on, is to find something that not all of them are gonna do well, you know? I don't strike gold every time, right? Um, but I know what to look for now. So using that knowledge and applying that to some of these unknown trees, I should have some pretty good success. Um, so we're gonna continue trying to find these new varieties, but uh, we're pretty much at the end now, I think, of we're getting closer to the end of what varieties exist within the greater fig community. You know, uh, there's only so many varieties. Now there's a lot of new seedlings coming in from California and that's great. Uh, there's still a lot of unknowns to be found here in, in the Northeast or really all kinds of parts of the, uh, the country. And those will, will continue to keep evaluating them, but think about, you know, all the interesting genetics that exist within UC Davis, that exist within a lot of the, you know, really special, well-documented Italian varieties or French varieties or a lot of the varieties of Spain, like from Ponza's collection. We're getting towards the end. There isn't really, you know, there isn't like um, many more varieties to acquire or try to really um, pique my interest, I think, in that way. So I think that's kind of where we're at. That's just a little chat here, guys, on genetic diversity. I want to thank you guys for watching and, and sticking around on this channel and um, kind of looking at, you know, just being in all of the genetic diversity that exists within, within figs. Uh, please, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. Check out our blog, figboss.com so much information there. Anyway, I'm going to enjoy these fruits. We'll see you guys soon. Take care.